Hello, everybody. I'm Janusz Kapp. It's really good to be back. I was here, not exactly here, but in this way last year also. And it's really fun to be back. Now, for those who don't know, know who I am, I'm Janusz Kapp from an Estonian company called Clarified Security. We do, we do vulnerability testing, some development, some research, uh, cyber exercises, trainings, all this kind of stuff, cool stuff. Uh, me, my, myself, I have a developer background. I used to be a web application developer. After that, a native code developer. I moved from there to uh, security. Uh, I also have some certificates that like, usually don't mean mu much. Uh, but uh, as a little proof that I might actually know what I'm talking about, I have found vulnerabilities in multiple web applications like Facebook, Adobe, Microsoft, Apple, Google. And I have from the last couple of years, multiple CVs from Apple products, Microsoft products, and Adobe. But this time, this talk about antivirus hacking, uh, this is based only my own experience and what I have tried. The goal of the talk is to help a little bit those people who also want to move into this kind of research to understand how and why and uh, in which ways can be attacked. I highly focus on drivers part, so antivirus consists also some drivers. So how to attack drivers? So people who are interested in kernel and driver attacking might also get some hints. But I will not demonstrate any zero-day exploits this time, but I will talk about one without saying actually where it's from. So starting off, why attack antiviruses? First of all, why not? It's cool. Antiviruses are meant to protect us, to help us. So by attacking them, you kind of attack the protector, which is always fun. Uh, secondly, antiviruses are really complex systems. They have a lot of elements, and there's a lot of vectors how to attack antiviruses. Additionally, antiviruses have to run in really high permissions, at least some parts of it. So if you hack antivirus, then you might have higher permissions than otherwise. So. Let's start from the beginning. What is antivirus consisting of? First of all, of course, QI, uh, graphical user interface, the runs where you click, where you say where to scan, what to do. Then there's multiple services. Like uh, services are part where the main meat of the antivirus locates. Uh, they do ser uh, scanning, uh, parsing, uh, backing, emulating, and all this kind of stuff. Then there's opta updaters that usually also are services, but Let's just say updaters. And there's software drivers, not drivers that handle some hardware, but only software drivers that do something like protecting the antivirus itself. For example, if you try to kill antivirus main process, it doesn't allow you in many cases, because the kernel part, the kernel drivers, protect it. And you have filter drivers that, uh, for example, filter out what uh, files is being opened in file system and what's happening in the background. So if we draw a picture, it would be something like this. Now the lines between show communications between different parts. So let's start from the really beginning. And human interface with the UI. So it's clicking, typing, and all this kind of garbage. So what people usually do. Now we move to a little bit more interesting parts, how antivirus different processes talk with each other. If you click some button or do something in graphical user interface, then the service that actually does, does the MIDI things, like scanning and stuff, have to be informed. And this kind of information movement between processes are done through different means. Uh, really commonly used are named objects that Windows allows great, like events, pipes, mutexes. There's also a possibility to do for uh, share information through shared memory. And RPC, or remote process calls, that are Windows ways how to do um, process, inter-process communication. Second part, really important part, and that I'm highly interested in, is how graphical user and fate faces, but mainly services, talk with the kernel. The kernel uh, inside the kernel, there's multiple drivers by the antivirus now. These drivers have to be, in some case, configured. Some information has to move in both directions. So how the user face talks with the kernel? It can't talk directly. So this is done by input-output controls. Uh, 
uh, IOCTL, or I even don't know how <laughs> it's correctly pronounced, uh, but uh, with uh, special calls that are made uh, and sent to the drivers. I will cover them more thoroughly later. So a little bit more about pieces. Uh, graphical user interface command line tools are the stuff that is visual and usable by the user. And the services, like I said, contains updaters, scanners, uh, supporting some supporting software that helps user, for example, parsers, packers, and emulators. And kernel space filter drivers, like I already talked, for example, for file systems, uh, service protectors that protect the actual antivirus services so they can't be killed. And some antiviruses uh, also contain some type of scanning and stuff also in the kernel side. Now, based on all of this, and this is still, still a little bit simplification. Probably we could talk days about how the different antivirus are built, but this is a broad sense. Now, when attacking some systems or stuff, the attack vectors are a way how to begin. You have to know through what or what to attack exactly. So in case of antiviruses, there's multiple possibilities. You can have remote vectors. A remote vectors means that you don't have yet any access to the machine that you are attacking. And local uh, vectors are in situations where you have some code already running on the computer, but you want to escalate privileges, for example. So uh, there's multiple remote vectors uh, connected to sending some files or doing some other stuff with updating parsers, packers, emulators. And local vectors, access control list issues, and the same IOCTL, how the antivirus con uh, communicates with the kernel, or drivers, for more exactly. So let's start with the uh, remote ones. Um, old antiviruses constantly update themselves. Uh, the signatures, the logic, how they work, even the main programs, and all of this has to be constantly updated, because uh, viruses also evolve really, really fast. So how the update is made is important. Is the connection to the update server encrypted? If it's not, can you do man in the middle? If it is encrypted, can you do still do man in the middle? Uh, if it's not encrypted, uh, is the patches sent back signed? If the signing does work, is it done correctly? For example, there has been situations, I don't know about antiviruses updating, but situations elsewhere where the signing is checked, but the signing is checked with in a valid uh, way. For example, only say, uh, checking does CA have a correct name. If it is, no keys is checked, actually. And of course, uh, usual memory corruption issues can happen also in the updating code base. For example, you do still man in the middle, you send back something. For example, a uh, server sends back the file name that is being updated, but you change it to something really, really long. Maybe you can overflow something. Maybe. So. But we move to the uh, main part of the antiviruses, uh, parsers. Uh, while many antiviruses use mainly also signature-based uh, detection, that just looking for predefined pre files or pre-described uh, files, a lot of antiviruses have additional functionality to parse different file formats to find some behavior or something strange or some encrypted or coded uh, attackers. So thanks to that, antiviruses, especially the more tricky ones, have to handle multiple file formats. I will now paste this description mainly on PDF files, because I kind of like PDF files. Last year was a really successful year for PDF file vulnerabilities for me. So let's say that antivirus have to handle PDF files. They parse it. And to say that PDF files are really simple is plainly wrong. PDF files have really uh, difficult specifications, and even Adobe Reader makes constantly mistakes on handling uh, PDF parsing. So even the company who pretty much created the format can't handle the format. To think that all the antiviruses can is kind of delusional. So memory corruptions can be happening inside them. And which is really interesting part on parsers and all this kind of stuff is that you don't actually have to open the PDF file for exploit to happen. Uh, when you're attacking, for example, Adobe Reader, then the person who gets the PDF some way have to actually open it. 
But if I send someone email containing PDF file, and his uh, email client downloads it to his computer automatically, doesn't execute, just downloads it to computer, then it already touches the hard drive, and antivirus goes and checks it. And since antivirus goes and checks it, then it already triggers the exploit. So you can take over uh, stuff that is not, uh, uh, you can take over computers by sending them stuff that they don't even actually open, per se. So people don't do anything wrong. And <laughs> really good example of this is last year, Symantec. Symantec antivirus uh, had flaw that caused uh, memory corruption by PA headers, which are PA headers. These are headers inside EXA and DLL files. Now, uh, if B uh, EXA and TLL file headers haven't changed much for quite some time. Now, if Symantec haven't ha discovered a fault inside handling the most common file type that they actually have to handle, then it shows that there must be a lot of different vulnerabilities in other stuff also. And there has been. Second part, uh, also, and by unpackers here, I don't mean only unpackers as unpacking zip and RAR and those files, but also exe files that are backed by some additional software. Uh, what a lot of antivirus, a lot of viruses, but not only viruses, but also legitimate software does is that they back the actual code, and during the runtime they unpack it and then execute it. For example, a Skype uh, installer does this. One example: Skype is not a virus. So uh, no software also does it. Uh, but in su such situations, um, all those antiviruses have to handle it. They have to unpack their R zip those files or those backed by some executables. They have to unpack it and then analyze them. Because if they analyze the original, then they get nothing out of that. So if those unpackers are written badly, they can also contain memory corruptions. And the example from that is, uh, again, from Symantec and Norton, where in last year uh, they had a situation where the unpackers, the unbacked EXE files content, uh, located in kernel, in actual kernel drivers. So if you sent it, EXE file that was backed by one really exact uh, packer and contained some overflow there, then the uh, EXE file didn't have to be executed by the user but only touched the hard drive. And after that, the ex exploit was triggered in kernel. After that, the attacker had full control over the kernel. This uh, vulnerability was discovered, and also the exploit was tried by Google Project Zero. Now, I highly recommend to read Google Project Zero blog if you're interested in exploit stuff, because at the moment where you understand everything that they are talking about, you are probably already quite good. Additionally, a lot of uh, antiviruses have emulators for CPUs and stuff. Uh, this is for situations where uh, the unpacker or some logic is inside the uh, malware written uh, by themselves, uh, malware, uh, malware writers. So let's say that uh, I'm writing malware. I write malware that actually does some bad things. But then I encrypt it and uh, write additional little snippet that uncrypts the uh, bad code. Now, this part that ungrips it, if you just look the executable as it is, it doesn't contain visually nothing bad. So what antiviruses does is they emulate the CPU uh, for, for example, first 10,000 instructions, and then scan the remaining memory to discover what bad things contain, uh, is contained there after that unpacking or running. Now, this can't be done in actual computer, CPU, because obviously that would already infect the machine. So they have emulators that emulate uh, x86, x64, or something like that, maybe ARM. But what can happen is that those emulators also contain vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, in such situations, again, memory corruptions can happen uh, you, again, don't have to actually execute it because antivirus does that in the emulator themselves. And the exploit steps can be written in machine code itself because it's written by the, it's executed by the emulator, and it emulate, uh, works exactly like CPU, 
So the attacking exploits, multiple exploit steps can be written in actual assembly code. And the example is from last year again, from ESET antivirus, uh, again discovered by uh, Google Project Zero, where just using push and pop and ESP instructions, you can overflow and get uh, write something to uh, somewhere uh, type of vulnerability where you can write everything, anything to anywhere in memory. So all those uh, type of targets, how to discover vulnerabilities from them? Well, I always have been loving fuzzing, so you can fuzz. The PDF files, some different file types, some pack packing stuff, all this kind of stuff. Um, then you can might uh, try reverse engineering to find vulnerabilities yourself by hand. Uh, you can target some logic flaws. Uh, there might not be exactly flo logic flaws, but some type of it. For example, historically, if you sent a zip bomb, it means zip file that contained the one file that was, I don't know, 10 gigs lo uh, uh, large, you send it, and after that, maybe antivirus crashes. It doesn't happen anymore, but this kind of approach, just to try something out of out of uh, your own imagination. And uh, then there's some crazy stuff. Uh, if you're interested, then Google Trend Micro versus Google, uh, Google Project Zero, uh, they discovered vulnerability in Trend Micro antivirus. Uh, that then Trend Micro antivirus, when installing the antivirus, also installed log server, or actually debug web server. And this debug web server ran in localhost and contained a lot of, lot of instructions. So my website could send uh, commands to your local host running on this port to execute some random programs, for example. And this was really crazy because Trend Micro fought against this quite heavily. So it uh, comments and uh, information exchange between Trend Micro and Google a Project Zero team became really, really funny. So I recommend to read it. There's a lot of laughing. Now, we move on to local project escalation uh, type of issues, uh, access control list issues. Uh, start of all stuff that you don't see anymore uh, with antiviruses that much, but with other services are the situation where service is set up so that anyone can change, for example, directory or file name that is run as a service. If you can change the file name, then you can point it to your own file name and the service will run well, as your program. Uh, there's also file permissions and uncoded paths. Uh, both of them not that common anymore, but still happen. Additionally, uh, like I say, named, uh, said before, there are things as named objects, like events, mutexes, pipes. You can research them. All of antiviruses use them quite heavily. So if they are configured incorrectly, so anyone can get a handle for them, for example, or can delete them or remove them, then you might be able, for example, if there's named pipe, and named pipes are used for communication between different antivirus processes, and you can create the connection to existing pipe and send your own garbage that will crash it or take control over the by memory corruption issues, then this is a way. Additionally, with mutexes and events, what you can, might, uh, can do is uh, you can toss antivirus software. For example, mark it to turn it, uh, itself off or create a situation where it just wants to do something that you want. And now we move to the part that uh, I'm a little bit more interested in lately. Uh, this is our ISCTL. Um, this is user land and driver communication, pretty much. How process talks with some other kernel uh, driven drivers. In Windows, call that is made to drivers to configure and set them up is device IO control. This is goes same for all drivers. It's not only antiviruses. So most of the driver vulnerabilities that you discover or read about go through this one API call. And this is also has been the main focus of uh, my work currently, and uh, at least the research on antiviruses. And uh, I will now dig a little bit more deeper into this and how it works and bring one example that I found. Uh, first of all, let's see, those are all parameters that device IO control function uh, uses. Now, we are not interested in all of them. Actually, really important ones are those four. 
first is device. This is a driver. Pretty much, you can say it. Uh, it's a driver which, uh, which will get the handler, the driver, that will get this device control call. Second one, control code, is a control code. Uh, it tells driver what to do. This is pre-arranged, uh, so, so you, who sends it and who receives it from kernel side have to know which, what which number means. And this is 32-bit integer. And then there are two uh, buffers, in buffer and out buffer. And both buffer also have sizes down there, but uh, buffers themselves are more important. So let's move back to the control code. This defines what functionality is called in the tri uh, driver side. This is, has to be understood by the driver. For example, let's, let's all agree that number one means that kill some process, number two means kill yourself, and number three means something else. This is something like similar to this. So driver itself ha has to give this a meaning. But device how you control the control code is multi-part. Now, this is 32 bits of what the uh, device uh, control code means. Now, there's a lot of parts that are not that important. There are actually a couple of bits that uh, says that uh, what access is needed. The kernel will not allow to do requests to stuff that are, uh, have lesser access, but this is not that important. The most important in that perspective is the first two bits, transfer type. And this transfer type defines how these buffers are sent to the driver. Since the, it's two bits long, there's four different possibilities. It's uh, method buffered, method in or out direct, and method neither. I will describe what, what it means. If we have method buffered and device IO control is called by the process, then what happens is that input is buffer is copied by OS to kernel, and the user space stuff can't uh, touch directly stuff the inside the kernel space uh, is copied to the kernel. Then the driver call code is called by operating system. The input is the same buffer inside the kernel is given to the driver, and driver writes output to the same buffer. And after that, the output is copied out by operating system. So operating system moves one thing to the, his own controlled area, lets the driver handle that, and then moves the output back. Now, if you have method indirect or out direct, then it's a little bit different. The input is still copied there. But when the device IO control is called, uh, the hand handler for a uh, driver is called, then the input is given, which locates inside a kernel, and output location is given also, that locates in user space and is under user control. Now, depending on the situation, was it method indirect or out direct, the kernel will also check automatically is the output buffer readable or writable, so some addition ch checks are made, but still the second buffer that is provided, the output buffer, is from the user space. And in some situations, the output is written directly to the output buffer. And then comes the last possibility, method neither. In this situation, device higher control is called by process, and both of the buffer, buffer locations are given directly to the driver. So all of those buffers provided to the uh, kernel driver is under user space control, so under user program control. Now, uh, what is the possibilities to attack this kind of uh, communication? First of all, there's multiple usual memory corruption. You send some stuff to the driver, uh, driver handles it badly, doesn't check some border values, and uh, memory corruption happens. There's also race conditions that I will show a little bit later, and hidden functionality. Hidden functionality is, for example, a lot of antiviruses have some option value to say that, please turn off your self-protection. Now, uh, if only admin can do it, it's okay. But what has happened in the past is the situation where some antivirus's driver side doesn't check that the message to stop protecting is sent by the admin uh, access, uh, pretty much by admin. So in su such situations, if you're a reverse engineer and understand that what type of call to the uh, driver turns off protection, then you can do this uh, call yourself. Your own program can do this kind of 
uh, request and turn off all the protections. But I will cover uh, one vulnerability that I have found. I can say which software it is, which antivirus it is, uh, but I, I think it's a little bit interesting how these kind of things can happen in uh, antiviruses and uh, in local privacy escalation situations. So, uh, I will cover race condition. How many of here know what means race condition? Cool. I didn't expect that much. Uh, so, real good. I will cover then one special situation from a race condition uh, that happened because the function number function control code that was used was uh, defined as method neither. So the both buffers, input and output, was in under user process control. So we have this situation. We have process. It has two threads. And we have two uh, in, in, uh, buffers, input and output buffer. And we know that the small part of the yellow part, uh, 0 to 100, that uh, this part of the input buffer has to be in between 0 and 100 because it is used as an uh, index in some, inside some array. So what we do is that we evaluate to zero, for example. So it checks the values. We do the device IO control with the first thread and give input and output buffers as a, well, input and output. Now, what happens is that the thread one will go to the kernel and uh, the thread will run in a kernel memory space. It will run the driver functionality. And this functionality is going and checking input value. Is this in this range that was uh, demanded? It has to be in range 0 to 100. OK, it checks the value. Everything is OK. Now it does something else before actually using this knowledge. So it does something else. It does check some other values or something like that. In the meantime, as it does something else, the second thread that's running in the same process goes and changes the input uh, part of the input buffer, uh, the value, the index value, to a something really, really large, for example. Now, after it has done that, the driver will come back and take the value from there because it checked already that. It checked the value is between 100, takes that from there, and uses it. Now, this is a real example from uh, one of the antivirus uh, drivers. And these kind of issues, usually, you can find mostly only by reverse engineering. Uh, but this shows uh, the green part does the first read of the, yeah, and the ESI is a pointer to uh, input buffer inside the user space. So first read is done in the green part. Then this value is checked in yellow part. Checked, it has to be between 0 and 3, I think it was. Uh, so it, uh, the value has to be between uh, 0 and 3. This check is made. Then something else happens. And the red part reuses it. But it, again, doesn't store it in somewhere local but again takes it from the buffer in user space. But user space can be modified in the middle by something else. So more correctly would be to read value from the user space, store it in local variable, check it, and then reuse it again, but not reread uh, re it from the memory uh, that is under user control. So and the program that, uh, I don't know, that's, it's POC, Proof of concept, this program just crashed the machine, blue screen of death. So we have input buffer. Uh, green ones are just preparation stuff. The yellow part just keeps doing again and again and again the same call to the driver. And the red part is constantly switching one particular value inside the input buffer. And what happens that between the green and red, uh, between the yellow and red one, actual green and red one, the value has been changed by the racing thread that constantly switches between them. So in green, the value 3 or 0 is red, and in red, the value A is red. And this is used for uh, calculating new po uh, pointer in uh, last uh, second line. And this will point to somewhere totally garbage.
So if you are doing this kind of research uh, at all, uh, then uh, to understand what's going on at all, which driver is used, which they locate, just a just list of the tools that I would recommend. Uh, additionally, of course, if you have money to buy IDA Pro, I would highly recommend it because I think this is a tool of the trade for reverse engineering. But even if you are just analyzing stuff that you can uh, look yourself and do, then Process Explorer is a really good tool to look out all the events, mutexes, all the objects, named objects. Uh, win object works also. And driver view and device tree to uh, find out all the drivers uh, that are, exist in the system, uh, which device they create, and how you can communicate with them. And I actually was going to demonstrate my own tool, but uh, sadly it's not ready yet, sorry. Uh, it will be uh, soon be found under name Foxhex uh, to do uh, those kind of requests to server, uh, to automate, uh, not server, uh, driver, to automate all these kind of attacks and to make it more easy to test because usually you have to write your own program each time or your own scripts to do all these kind of requests. I just want to automate and uh, make it a little bit easier. So in a couple of months, Google Foxhex. Hopefully it's ready by then. So, thank you for listening, and any questions? Is there any questions? You can ask later also, I don't mind. Hi, man. How the hell did you get into this? <laughs> uh, step by step. Uh, I start with web application security uh, and then thought that reverse engineering seems fun. And that from that moved exploitation and then thought that uh, kernels, kernel stuff might be also fun. So step by step, it's easy to, s it's easy to begin with this stuff when you have a development background because you know how things work. So you said the stuff you found are not zero days, but so what, what was the results, basically? Can you summarize the things you found in your research? Uh, you mean what I have done with the zero days or with the, what I have more found? What you found now with your research in these antiviruses, kind of, so what were the, the bugs, the vulnerabilities you found? You said that they were not zero days, but you still found attack space and... Oh, uh, <laughs> I have found zero days, uh, but I can't talk about them because they are not fixed. Actually, one is fixed, one uh, that I found on Trend Micro, uh, but this was zero, uh, zero point reference, and it was happening just because the uh, driver part didn't verify one of the values. And this was interesting, like you have one if clause missing. I didn't think that this is interesting to describe. Okay, but as a summary, so how many issues you found, or I'm how just many? interested, so how, yeah, or how severe, just, a summary, brief summary. Uh, actually, from uh, antiviruses, I haven't got any CVEs. I have gotten a lot from fuzzing, uh, the, um, like uh, from Microsoft and uh, Adobe. But from antiviruses, they don't give that much out. And if you, if themselves, they don't give out. For example, Microsoft and Adobe gives out CVEs. If they don't give up themselves, then you have to ask CVE from the Midgre. And this is kind of annoying process that I have avoided. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You talked about how to research and uh, find those vulnerabilities, but why don't you write exploits for them? Sorry? Why don't you write exploits for those vulnerabilities? Well, who has said that? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, writing, uh, finding vulnerabilities are much, much, much more easier than writing exploits. Writing exploits take way much more time because many, many times, for example, all those stuff I found in Microsoft and Adobe, they're fuzzing. You just prepare it, let it run for a couple of months, and then you uh, look for results and analyze the results. It's mostly waiting. Uh, writing exploits is working, 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 working. And as a hobby, 
somewhat more time consuming. Okay. Thank you.